don't see much difference between starting to go to shul and my parents being nervous that I was going to end up in Jerusalem wearing a black hat, you know, and, and, and uh, side curls, and coming out as a gay in them. I'm sure they thought I would end up in a dress somewhere, you know, on a, on, on a dock, you know, soliciting sailors. I'm always meeting people in clubs, and the first thing they say to me is they look at me, the fear of panic comes over them, and they say, uh, you haven't seen me here, you don't know anything about it yet, you know, don't tell my mother. That's crazy. Um, you know, so one thing is that people have to come out, don't they? I certainly don't think lesbian and gay Jews are a threat to the Jewish community. I think that the Jewish community will be very much in enriched by their presence, by their visibility and what they have to offer. For all Jewish gay men and women, you know, it's really difficult to come from an orthodox background and, and be accepted. You know, and, and the strain of going into a gay place, you know, and you're always thinking in the background of, the back of your mind, what would my rabbi say when he found out that I was in a gay pub? So my family background, as a, I'd say as a political Jewish background, a radical politics, um, that both informed my own politics, but it also gave me the space to be a lesbian. I think that was really important, that I didn't feel that somehow I had to conform. My background is a very religious, orthodox Jewish upbringing in which there was no reference to homosexuality at any time. The way in which I dealt with being um, both Jewish and gay was that I sorted out being gay and forgot about being Jewish. And basically, like I think many other people, I simply moved away from a community which appeared to have no place for me in it. I came from Yeshiva as well, and I was put under sedation. I was given tranquilizers. I wasn't allowed to go out. I wasn't allowed to go for walks because I might meet another gay man. Or, and I think that was really wrong. You know, and because of that, I revolted against the Jewish religion. I grew up in a very secular in, uh, in household and was not proud of being a Jew. And until, uh, for me, the coming out experience has been twofold. First, I came out as a Jew, began to discover my Jewish heritage and claim it with pride. And it was only after I'd done that that I was able to come to terms with my sexual identity. And, then, and now the two are overlapping. <laughs> I'm sorry your grandma's dead. Mm. Tiny little coffin, huh? Sorry I didn't introduce you. I always get so closety at these family things. No, Butch. You get Butch. Hi, Cousin Doris. You don't remember me. I'm Lou, Rachel's boy. Lou, not Lewis, because if you say Lewis, they'll hear the sibilant S. I don't have a sibilant S. I don't blame you hiding at bloodlines, and Jewish curses are the worst. I personally would dissolve if anyone looked me in the eye and said, Fur. Well, fortunately, wasps don't say fur. Oh, and by the way, darling, Cousin Doris is a dyke. No. Really? Oh, you don't notice anything. If I hadn't spent the last four years filleting you, I'd swear you were straight. Whenever there's a function, wedding or the mitzvah, I get all the family coming over to me saying, please go by you. I say, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, I can't say anything because my parents are there. They've told me to keep strong, keep quiet. Um, and it's just really frustrating that I can't speak out and say, well, I'm not going to be getting married at all. You're not going to see me under the canopy.
But there was that pressure, always pressure there, to get married, you know, as all nice Jewish boys should, meet a girl, um, settle down, have kids, and so on. And everyone sometimes says, well, one day you'll make a, a lovely father, and I just want to say, well, what, one day you'll allow laws to be passed that will let me adopt children. In a mixed relationship, as, as we are, there's a very strong thread around being Jewish, that, that identity in our family, that there's a Jewish identity that's important, not just for me, but also for bringing up our daughter, that she has a sense of being Jewish. It was important to us to choose to have a, a Jewish donor for Franya, um, and that was a very clear emotional... It was a very conscious choice. I've never wanted children, ever. And sometimes I feel like I'm betraying my people. I'm being completely selfish. I feel I can be much more productive as an artist and that there are multiple ways of perpetuating a people. And I think this whole issue about per perpetuating the Jewish people is somehow quite, maybe subconsciously quite important to our parents' generation. Um, but um, I think if you ask some of them whether they prefer um, their son to have a Jewish boy or a non-Jewish girl. <laughs> I know for me, my parent, my, for my parents, it was much more important for me to have a Jewish, a Jewish boy. And when I came home, when I came home with a Jewish boyfriend, they were like really, really delighted, and um, it was really like wonderful that he became integrated into my family and came to all family functions and um, religious events and all sorts of things. And um, I think the fact that he was Jewish was like really important for them. It was like something tangible that they could understand and relate to. But a lot of Jewish guys, because you, mother and father are such a great influence on. You. Do you know what I mean? In fact, I remember phoning my mother when I was about 18 year old. I said, Mom, I said, I'm Jewish, I'm gay, I'm left handed, and I want to be a drag queen. <laughs> and there was this short pause. And this voice came back and said, You couldn't come round, you had to phone. Descendants of this immigrant woman. You do not go up in America. You and your children and their children with a Goyesh and names. You do not live in America. No such place exists. You clay is the clay of some Litvak staple. You air, the air of the steppes, because she carried the old world on her back across the ocean in a boat. And she put it down on Grand Concourse Avenue or in Flatbush, and she break that earth into your bones. And you pass it onto your children. This ancient, ancient culture. And oh. I'm constantly faced with, with a feeling when I'm talking about being Jewish that somebody that's not Jewish doesn't fully quite understand what I'm talking about. And it's really much more than just a religion. It's, it's a whole culture. I mean, it's a culture of 5,000 years and we've got customs and it doesn't necessarily mean we believe in God or we believe in a certain you know, type of dogma. Since the Second World War, the Jewish community in this country, as in many other countries, has lived under a sense of threat the shadow of the Holocaust, uncertainty about the existence of the State of Israel, uncertainty about anti-Semitism. You've had people who came here as immigrants, had to make their way in British society. Uh, many of them changed their names, tried to become more acculturated. And it's not been a very confident community up until very recently. And it's within that context that these kind of issues uh, are being discussed.
Jews are in a, a tiny minority. Contrary to popular opinion, their position in uh, media and uh, public life, there are less than 300,000 Jews in this country. And as a consequence, we have always been a community that's looked over our shoulder at the majority community. While we have within our tradition not only an enormous capacity for compassion, but an enormous body of legislation for it, we fail to effectively exercise that in regard to homosexuality. The Jewish community has always wanted to present to the outside world the idea that it, it, it has no problems, that, that it is a very stable community, um, that it is a well least community and I think for many people it is very difficult to appreciate the fact that within that community there will be as many lesbians and gay men as there are in the in the non-Jewish community. I don't think um, Jew Jewish community is any more or less homophobic than any other community. I mean, homophobia goes for everywhere. But I do think there's a particular dynamic about being a member of a minority community within a majority culture where if you are seen to be different, you're somehow chinking the armour, that there's this sort of very protective um, survival, that we have to all stay together. I think that also goes for Jews marrying out, that they're seen as somehow letting the side down, as diluting the community, and I'm sure as lesbians we're seeing the same. What would you say to Jewish people who are lesbian or gay? Do you feel they don't belong to the community? Definitely. 100%. They don't belong? Yeah. Well, you'd say they weren't Jewish? Uh, nobody can take their Jewishness away, but they have no place in the Jewish community. It's, it's part of life. It's part of life today. Part of life any day. It didn't just start up. I'm sure of that. Matzo balls. Can you eat any other part of the animal? Chop liver. Oi vey, everyone. New Moon magazine is a new Jewish monthly magazine and over a period of about six months um, that there was a very very ferocious row between different New Moon readers about whether or not um, any Jewish publication should make any reference to homosexuality. We didn't believe the reaction that we got from some parts of the community when we did that. To us it seemed a perfectly natural thing to do. Uh, but we were banned by uh, various organizations and individuals in the Jewish community. The same people who object so strongly to the appearance of gay and lesbian listings in New Moon have no objection at all to the appearance of non-kosher restaurants in New Moon. Uh, these people are generally hypocrites. Um, and what they're doing is they're using the fact that um, uh, homosexual practice is one of the things that's regarded as a sin in Orthodox Judaism uh, as a reason to vent their, uh, their prejudices. What this raises is who decides within the Jewish community what is appropriate Jewish behaviour. For many people who are both Jewish and lesbian and gay, we have no choice but to occupy a position within both communities and somehow to reconcile the two. My Yiddish Mama I need her more than ever now My Yiddish mama I long to kiss her in good brow 
I long to hold her hand once more as in days gone by and ask her to forgive me for the things I did that made her cry There's a general attitude among sort of general Jewish orthodoxy that there's a kind of set way of doing things and there's a set path and you know Jews should be like this and that excludes so many people not just lesbians and gays it excludes um, you know people who are working class or people who are disabled or unemployed and so many people are sort of you know pushed out of the Jewish community for one reason or another and I feel the Jewish community needs to sort of open its eyes and realize that, that we're a really really diverse group of people. Okay, so there's a common notion that the Jewish community is monolithic has a single view on everything, Israel, the lot, and that's why we have a chief rabbi. It is no more monolithic than uh, the Christian church. It can contains within it as many schisms and divisions. And just as the Anglican church is not represented with the whole of Christendom in this country, so too the chief rabbi in the United Synagogue of Great Britain is not representative of it either. I think I heard the ex-chief rabbi on, on the radio, he was talking about AIDS, and he made some comments which made me very angry. And I felt that he was putting forward a Jewish point of view, and it was not my point of view, um, and I'm sure it wouldn't have been a, a gay man or, or lesbian woman's point of view. So I think that's very key, that the, the, the orthodox community have to realise that if they're going to speak on behalf of us all, they have to embrace all of, all of our views. Because the Jewish people, they frown on being homosexual. I mean, what are we supposed to do? Tie a knot in it, for goodness <laughs> sake? I mean, really. Did you see them in the desert with Moses in those skirts? I'm sorry. Long hair, I rest my case. Who defines the Jewish community? Who says who can be a good Jew? Who says who is a bad Jew? It is the Jewish establishment that decides that you are not part of this community. It is very much the rabbis who act as the gatekeepers and who say, yes, you can have access to, the, to this community, you can have access to the advantages of being part of this community. If the Jewish community continues to define itself in this way, then this is a community which may get purer and purer, but also it's one that gets smaller and smaller and more and more rigid. Judaism is not a religion that is affected by fads or by fashion. We stand for principles, and those principles of human nature are absolutely immutable. We are there to impose a perspective on society rather than to allow society to impose its perspective upon us. Rabbi, I'm afraid of the crimes I may commit. Please, mister. I'm a sick old rabbi facing a long drive home to the Bronx. You want to confess, better you should find a priest. But I'm not a Catholic, I'm a Jew. Worse luck for you, Bubbala. Catholics believe in forgiveness. Jews believe in guilt. I didn't feel I could talk to my rabbi. It's the last thing you, you'd, you'd go and tell him. I, I, mean, um, I mean, all I could think of was, you know, Leviticus 18 or whatever that tells you that two men couldn't sleep together. And I just thought he'd get out his, his uh, chumash and say, well, there it is, and, you know, bye-bye. Um, perhaps that was wrong with me, but certainly that was the impression um, that was, was put across, and that was a reformed synagogue. Contemporary rabbinic Judaism tells us that the Bible is against homosexuality. All it can refer to as the basis of that objection is a statement that says that one man should not lie with another man after the manner of womankind because it is an abomination. In the very same paragraph of the Bible in Leviticus, it says exactly the same thing about eating shellfish. Uh, but I don't see any huge reaction among the Anglo-Jewish establishment about shellfish eaters or oyster uh, aficionados. They don't sort of cut them off from the community and disfranchise them. To live with brotherly love or with sisterly love in affection and in happiness is one thing, and that is totally accepted by the Torah. But to take that a step beyond into physical relationships is the point at which the Torah says, or at which God says, this is no longer a healthy relationship. If there were a ten-point scale in, in Jewish life as to 
the way in which relationships should be expressed. A heterosexual married relationship would not necessarily be at the top any more than a homosexual relationship would be at the bottom. What would be at the bottom would be rape, unconsenting, uncaring, uh, self-centered sexual activity. And what would be at the top would be a relationship between two caring adults, conscious of each having a need to grow and to love. And if they happen to be heterosexual, or if they happen to be homosexual, the distinction wouldn't be of any real importance. I do feel Leviticus is as subject to interpretation as any other, any, anything else in the Torah, or indeed in the whole Tanakh. From my perspective, the questioning and challenging presence of feminist women is going to make, I think, as big a transformation as there had to be after the fall of the Temple in, in 70 CE, when Judaism practically had to reinvent itself. The really loving challenge from heterosexual women, from gays and lesbians, is going eventually to make as large a transformation, which also will not make Judaism less Jewish. We have perhaps reached a point where we are able to relax just enough to say it is possible to be Jewish, but it is also possible to be gay and Jewish without in any way paying disrespect to our history uh, or indeed without in any way damaging our own integrity and that's an achievement. We keep only focusing on the religious aspect of being Jewish. That there is a way then that the gay community never has to take us on and we never ask them to take us on because we're so busy going into the religious institutions that we never actually sit down with our gay allies and say look You've got to see us as Jews and know us as Jews. The complexity of our lives, the, the particular history that we have, uh, needs to be understood, it needs to be properly acknowledged, and the, the gay media needs to pay attention to that. Historically, there's always been um, a very major cultural influence from the Jewish community on every mainstream culture. If I look back and I look at what was written, say, within the women's movement, uh, there were a lot of Jews in the women's movement, a lot of Jewish feminist writing, um, Jewish lesbians writing, and, and it's taken time, but that's now much more overt. People come out as being Jewish, as being lesbian, whereas maybe 20 years ago we didn't. For me, being a gay Jewish author is being the most I am as a writer. It's drawing on all the strengths in my background and all the richness that's available to me in gay culture and Jewish culture. But it's people who are writing now and who are actually saying that, that there, is, um, there is a life that we lead which ought to be celebrated, there is a life that we lead uh, that should be talked about and written about. And it's not about saying being gay is complicated, being Jewish is more complicated. It's actually about saying there is a meeting point between being Jewish, lesbian and gay, which is now creating something new, a really a very passionate, very exciting uh, artistic literary culture. A large and loving family. We assemble that we may mourn collectively this good and righteous woman. When um, Angels in, in America was premiered at the National Theatre, uh, although uh, two of the most significant characters in the play are, are Jewish, and the opening uh, 10 or 15 minutes of the play uh, was very much about Jewish life and Jewish history, this was not mentioned in any of the reviews uh, in the gay press. And why it's hard to see us as Jews in the gay community is a good question. I don't think it's completely the fault, if we're talking fault, of non-Jewish people. Are we as Jews ready to be seen? I think within the liberation movement, um, Jews are often seen as being the oppressors rather than the oppressed because of um, the connection that Jews have with Israel. And so I think that leads to um, further oppression of you know, Jew Jewish, lesbian and gay needs. And the idea that we as Jews also support Palestinian self-determination seems to get lost. And we get merged in identity politics with the politics of the state, the government of Israel. And we're not seen as a Jewish people who differs from a governmental policy. And in identity politics, that has to happen. About 10 years ago, um, the attitude, particularly to people who were just coming out, 
was um, the most important thing in your life is that you are gay, that you explore what it means to be gay. If that means getting rid of your family, if that means getting rid of your history and carving out a gay identity really on the dance floor of heaven, if that's what it means to you, then that is what you should do. I'd always felt very uncomfortable about the complete rejection of the family when I first became involved in, in the women's liberation movement. And it's only much, much later having an understanding of that from mainly from reading writings by black women around the role of the family for, for um, minority, marginalized, marginalized communities. communities. Yeah. And realizing that, yeah, as a, a Jewish um, feminist, as a Jewish lesbian, that the family is important. It's a place for security, for survival. Mm. And that there is a role for the family and you can't, I can't reject, I could never reject my family outright. There is a far greater acknowledgement that we all have very particular histories uh, that we do not necessarily wish to, to, to relinquish our histories or to relinquish our families, um, that it's extremely important for all of us to have a sense of the link with our past and an understanding of, of, of how we've been formed. Growing up as a child of survivors and knowing from a very early age, first grade, that my parents had been brutalized and imprisoned and that my, all my relatives had been killed by the Nazis was terribly frightening and disorienting and made it very hard for me to identify positively with being Jewish, which is really natural. I mean, for a six-year-old boy, n knowing information like that, which is so terrible and so burdensome, why would you want to positively identify with being Jewish? We grow up with so much loss, no grandparents, no cousins, no, no family pictures. I mean, people take that for granted. No, no sense even of, oh yeah, I'm like my cousin Samuel, or I'm like my aunt, or I'm like this person. The sense of connection with the generations is lost, and that's very painful to deal with. So, uh, and I think for, for Jews, and it's hard and then when you're a gay Jew there's another level of separation because you uh, you are something that your larger culture finds offensive and disgusting and trafe. There's, there's clearly a, a similarity of experience between Jewish people and lesbians and gay men. Um, not only are there the similarities in terms of visibility and invisibility but clearly there's also the shared experience of the Holocaust. Um, one of the difficulties is that uh, very few Jewish people are prepared to acknowledge the fact that many lesbians and gay men died in the concentration camps. And although most um, gay people will certainly acknowledge uh, the effect of the Holocaust on Jewish people, on the whole it isn't really much talked about. And for straight Jews to ignore what gay and lesbian Jews have to say is disgraceful. I think because uh, given the history of Jews in this century and any other century, um, they cannot afford to ignore a minority that has been oppressed. But if they're really concerned about the survival of the Jewish people, we have a lot to teach them about survival. We have a lot to teach them about not assimilating, breaking out, taking a risk. And our, our creativity as a gay Jewish people belongs at the center of Jewish institutions. Young. Jewish people should be able to sort out being lesbian or gay without walking out from everything that they've been brought up with for the previous 16 to 18 years. And it must be possible uh, for people who choose to identify mainly as Jewish not to feel that there's absolutely no hope whatsoever of them finding a place within the lesbian and gay community. I'd like to finish this little section and to all those Jewish people who decide that they want to be gay when they grow up, go for it. You want to be straight? Go for it. But you'll get bored. <laughs> We're Jews and we're proud to be gay and lesbian and bisexual and, and we're here and we don't want, you know, people's tolerance. We just want people to accept, you know, to, to see us as equal and, and valid and we are, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here. Oh, I know that I owe what I am. To that dear little lady, so old and gray. To that.
that wonderful Yiddish mama. Rosemary Fanikayadi, photographer, born Lagos, 1955. Rotemi saw the visual arts as a way of making sense of life. He wasn't a conceptual artist. He didn't set out to do a piece of work that meant this or that. But his work reveals him. I think he was quite discreet in his private and personal life. But some of the work verges on the confessional. On three counts, I am an outsider. in matters of sexuality, in terms of geographical and cultural dislocation, in not being the respectably married professional my parents expected. It has been my destiny to be an artist with a sexual taste for other young men. Rotomi turned up at my flat in the late summer of 1983 to show me his portfolio. Um, it was quite a, an extraordinary sight. He was wearing bright lemon yellow leather trousers and a black leather cap, and he had a huge portfolio. Um, I sp spent about two hours looking at the work. I'd never seen anything like it. It was quite extraordinary. Um, and quite exciting. Also, he was quite an extraordinary person. I'd never met anybody like him before. Um, we became lovers, and a few months later, we decided to live together. I left Africa as a refugee over 20 years ago. A distance has developed between myself and my origins. Forbidden areas of creative inquiry have opened up to me. Where traces of my former values remain, I take new readings of them from an unusual angle. The results are disorientating. In my first period, painting with light, my work is about having a good time, experiencing life, color, Sex.
Murasumi worked from his own experience. He used his imagination to work through the experiences he'd had in different places that he'd lived in. I think because of what he'd seen of power and its abuses, he developed a, a dislike of authority and a mistrust of power. To assist in the restoration of conditions of law and order to the island of Grenada. There are a brutal group of leftist thugs. He became a kind of political and sexual rebel. He, he was never, he never saw himself as an insider. In his work, he challenged the art establishment and its political opponents. And he often used visual jokes to do that. He always avoided um, pandering to any orthodoxies. Historical awareness has fueled my creativity. In Africa, the language and culture of my own people, the Yoruba, was not taught in school. In exploring Yoruba history and civilization, I have rediscovered and revalidated areas of my own experience and understanding. I see parallels between my own work and the Oxobo artists in Yoruba land who have resisted cultural subversion and celebrate the rich secret world of our ancestors. This world is consigned by the West to the museums of primitive art and culture. The Yoruba cosmology is treated as no more than bizarre superstition. Modern Yoruba art does sometimes fetch high prices in the galleries of New York and Paris. It is prized for its exotic appeal. The modern versions of the Yoruba beliefs carried by slaves to the New World have become in their carnival form tourist attractions. The Europeans faced with the dogged survival of alien cultures are as mercantile as ever they were in the days of the slave trade. They are trying to sell our culture as a consumer product. We could call the second period of his work Techniques of Ecstasy, which is the title of some of the works he did at that time. Um, all the photographs he took then were in black and white. And that wasn't because he had any aesthetic preference for that. It was more to do with keeping costs down. But I think sometimes necessity can render good service to design. What distinguishes these pictures from the earlier painting with light um, pictures which were quite exuberant and riotous, is that the, the black and whites have a kind of classical simplicity and an elegance. Some white photographers desire black males. They mythologize black virility. They exploit it. They exploit it as Lingy Riefenstahl exploited Africa. They exploit it as the modern media exploits Africa in its victim imagery. We must reappropriate such images. We must transform them into images of our own creation. We must imaginatively investigate blackness, maleness, sexuality. This is easier said than done. I don't think Rotomi's work was ever just about cultural or sexual identity or oppression. Um, he took it for granted that he was black and that he liked having sex with men. And I think those elements are, are explicit or implied in most of his photographs. But I think there are other concerns there. Um, in particular, trying to make sense of the connections that exist between West African culture and Western or European culture, and also um, to make sense of the, the correspondences between ancestral and contemporary values. In African traditional art, the mask does not represent a material reality. The artist tries to approach a spiritual reality through images drawn from human and animal forms. Photography can aspire to the same imaginative interpretation of life. My reality is not what is presented as reality in Western photographs. I try to make concepts of reality ambiguous. I try to open them to reinterpretation by bringing out the spiritual dimension. Yoruba priests and artists call this the technique of ecstasy. I translate my rage and my desire into new images. Images that undermine conventional perceptions. Images that reveal hidden worlds. Many of the images are sexually explicit. 
Many of the images, to be more precise, are homosexually explicit. I make my pictures homosexual on purpose. Black men from the third world have not before revealed to the West or their own societies a shocking fact. Black men can desire each other. danger that has become a threat to us all. The attacks were concentrated and carefully targeted to minimize casualties among the Libyan people. Anyone can get it, man or woman. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So don't die of ignorance. In the last three years of his life, the joie de vivre of the earlier pictures gave way to a darker, more elegiac vision that was when he produced the Abiku series. Abiku means born to die. And their name was given by parents to sickly children who they fear may want to return to the spirit world. Rotomi had discovered that his own name was an Abiku name, meaning stay by me. We also began to work collaboratively around that time. I think you need a high level of mutual respect and trust to work together successfully. And I think we had that. We also began to experiment again with color photographs at that time and with gum bichromate and hand toning. It was an important step for both of us to work together but it's not really for me to comment on these pictures. I'm not surprised my work is shunned or discouraged by the establishment. I'm not surprised the homosexual bourgeoisie is more supportive. Black ass sells almost as well as black dick. I'm not surprised that the galleries and press felt safer with my ethnic work. I'm not surprised they occasionally take on some of the less overtly threatening and outrageous pictures. This is a classic liberal tradition. Black is only beautiful as long as it keeps within white frames of reference. If I ever managed to get an exhibition in Lagos, I suspect riots would break out. I would be accused of purveying corrupt and decadent Western values. But if I could take my work to the rural Africa, perhaps they would recognize my smallpox gods. Perhaps they would recognize my transsexual priests. Perhaps they would recognize my images of desirable black men in a state of sexual frenzy. They would recognize the tranquility of communion with the spirit world they might have less fear of encountering the darkest of Africa's dark secrets by which I seek to gain access to the soul. Thank you. 
I think it's very difficult to reconcile yourself to the, d the sudden death of a, of a young person. And I've been trying to come to terms with it, both emotionally and creatively, since then. I think because in living together and working together, we refuse to recognize the boundaries of race or culture or class or sexual propriety, we came a long way together and I feel that I'm continuing in that direction now alone. But I think Rotimi's spirit will always be a part of my life and work. And I feel in many ways that the work I've done since he died is still a collaboration. Um, what do I think about it? It's surprising, I think. Um, I don't think it's quite what I expected. It's so melancholy, man. <laughs> it's just different. It's different. I'm not art-wise, mind you. I'm not art-wise. Yeah, I'm just taking it in. I've got. I'm just keeping an open mind, really. I mean, it sounds really tried, but beautiful, loving, humorous, talented. I don't know. I just loved him. I think it's really intriguing. I particularly like the black and white photographs. I think. I don't know. I, I really don't know. I, um, <laughs> I could never be a, a critic uh, to say, you know, I saw, I saw. You understand? Because for what, what I see is completely different what maybe he's trying to say. You understand what I mean? Because most artists are trying to relate and most people see different things. You understand? That's, that's my interpretation. You know? What do you think? When I was younger, um, I used to play with the boys, football, cowboys and Indians. I did not have a Wendy house. I had Action Man. I wasn't heavily into makeup as I grew up and I was comfortable in trousers. I don't think you can separate the skinhead dress with its politics because it's a question of impressions. People, if people see a skinhead walking down the street, they won't assume that it's just a gay man dressed as a skinhead or it's a liberal man dressed as a skinhead, they will see a skinhead. The Jewish Lesbian and Gay Helpline offers a confidential information support and counselling service to Jewish lesbians, gay men and their families and friends. It's open from 7 until 10pm, Mondays and Thursdays, but is open now on 071 706 3123 or 3121. Or you can write to them at BM Jewish Helpline, London WC1N 3XX.